I see we have a number of attendees right now. Uh, I would like to say welcome to our dear attendees and uh, apologize to you all for the delay. Uh, we would wait if a few minutes more to uh, have more attendees and all of the registrants. So thank you for being patient and we will start the webinar in the next few minutes.
Hello, everyone. My name is Katayun Madani, and I'm, I'm one of the Incision uh, International Co-Chairs. Uh, I will be taking over for a few moments as uh, our wonderful host and moderator and my colleague and education team leader, Ahmed Reza Abbaslu, is actually having some internet uh, connection issues. Uh, I wanted to first and foremost welcome everyone to this webinar. Thank you for joining us today. Um, uh, I would like to uh, begin the webinar by uh, uh, introducing our distinguished uh, panel. Today, the focus of our um, topics are going to be um, medical education, as you are all aware. Um, just one moment as I turn in all the documents. Uh, well, can, can you, you can can hear me? Yes, we can hear you, Reza. Please oh. join us. <laughs> I'm so Thank sorry you. for the trouble. I, I don't know what, what, what's going on here. Uh, I lost the connection. I'm really sorry again. I apologize to everyone. Uh, I would like to say welcome to all of our great attendees and our honorable faculties and panelists. Uh, this week, this session is the third session of our webinar series on COVID-19. Uh, the series that uh, you have attended the uh, first one as the student's role in COVID-19 pandemic and the second one, uh, the title was, was uh, well-being and uh, mental health. Uh, this uh, webinar, as you know, is going to be uh, about medical education. As just re-mentioning and uh, reviewing some points, this webinar is being recorded and is going live on Facebook. So your friends and everyone can see the live session on the Facebook and we will provide the uh, recorded version of this uh, webinar a little later. Uh, since we've lost uh, lots of time, uh, I would like to go to the next part. I'm uh, I'm really appreciating our uh, guests, our moderators, uh, Dr. Azim Mirzadada and Professor John Norsini, uh, who's kindly uh, accepted our invitation for supporting us and being part of this great webinar. Uh, I would like to introduce the first faculty moderator, Dr. Azim Mirzadada, MD. And uh, he's an assistant professor of internal medicine and the former chair of the Department of Medical Education at Tehran University of Medical Sciences. He has been involved in Tom's MD curricular reform since its beginning and was the director of EDO at the School of Medicine for 10 years. He is also the former EDC director at the Ministry of Health and Medical Education in Iran. Currently, he is the chief of section in general internal medicine at the Imam Khomeini Hospital Complex at Tehran, Iran. Dr. Mirzazadeh, the floor is yours. Uh, good afternoon, good evening, good morning, everybody all over the world. Uh, it's really my pleasure and honor. I'm honestly talking about my feeling uh, to be with you with so enthusiastic and passionate students who are uh, who deal with the uh, current situation proactively and because the sake of time uh, i just mention a few sentences about the current situation and my understanding and feeling about it uh, the COVID-19 is the reason I feel that we are now here and we are with each other to talk about this epidemic that uh, very soon turned to a pandemic. And I'm sure that uh, the most important issue I, I feel that we face is the loss 
of our loved ones, not only among our friends or families, but also at the global level, and so important to me. Uh, we usually talk about the challenges of uh, COVID-19 for medical education by talking about challenges that COVID-19 embark on medical education. But I think that uh, the most important issue before that is about the impact of COVID-19 on the community at any level. Um, in community, we face currently with a recession, economic recession, with unemployment. And uh, this means that many people now and near future have less access to health care service, quality health care service and less access to food, in a food, and other uh, issues that's relevant to health of human being. And therefore, we are facing with a deterioration of uh, social determinant of health. All around the world. And I think that First of all, we should be careful about the impact of COVID-19 for the whole society because the social accountable medical education should be cautious about the impact of such pandemic on the whole society. I, I, I think that it's much more important that the impact of uh, COVID-19 on academies. Uh, and the second point is challenges of COVID-19 for health care system and health profession education. Uh, personally, I found during the COVID-19, because I was involved uh, in some levels to cope with COVID-19 in uh, Imam Khomeini General Hospital Complex, IKC, during late February and also March. And I found a lot of uh, challenges and shortcomings in our health care system. Uh, the most important one is the unpreparedness of our system to cope with a uh, crisis, especially contagious crisis, which is so different from uh, another type of disasters or crisis. And we, we face a lot of panic, hopelessness, loneliness, and uh, we, we've, uh, we found a lot of challenges for professionalism among students, among residents. For example, the, be, this, the most simple one is about, uh, is the medical student is in charge for care of patient and is it true to uh, be out of the hospital during COVID-19 or not? I'm not sure what the correct answer, but it's a major issue for all of us. And also the ambiguity about the future of medical education, when the medical school will be open in a natural way. And therefore, I think that uh, there are a lot of challenges, but at the same time, uh, it showed us that uh, Prevention and hygiene is so important, even rather than a complex system of health care. The hand hygiene is much more important for care and for survival of physicians and patients during COVID-19, rather than many uh, complicated and complex uh, procedures and interventions. I, I, I trust in uh, 
complex medicine, but I believe that we need uh, such sort of things in our healthcare system. It reminds us about the importance of solidarity among all people around the world. And also, it shows the importance about uh, thinking about uncertainty. One of the major challenges that we face during COVID-19 is about the uncertainty. But so interestingly, the medicine is full of uncertainty. And it is the top of an iceberg. And I feel that besides a lot of challenges, COVID-19 provides us a lot of opportunities to think differently about routines at the social level and also at the teaching and learning and healthcare level. And we should use these opportunities because the challenges are inherently exist during a, a pandemic. And the only thing that we could do is to use our innovation, passion, enthusiasm, and uh, hopefulness to use these opportunities. Sorry for lengthy talk at the beginning. Thank you very much, Dr. Mirzazadeh, for your great speech. Uh, the truth and the fact is that uh, seeing this pandemic from uh, several aspects is, uh, is a very important thing that usually during crises and uh, hard times we forget to you know see you know any kind of problem from different aspects and we just you know start to grieve and we start to maybe nag for <laughs> you know frankly and we don't know what to do in the hard situation and uh, it is important to see each you know threat as an opportunity to Th thank you very much for your great speech i i really appreciate you uh, just before going to the next faculty i would like to ask uh, i would like to remind some uh, points to our attendees uh, during the webinar you you can submit your questions in the q and a box please 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 if you have any question do not submit your question in the chat room please submit your question put your question in the q and a box so we will uh, we will consider your question and answer your question at the end of the meeting after the discussion part and also you have access to chat room uh, and you can you know uh, talk there chat with your uh, with other audience and send messages in that chat room just uh, be careful that if you want to send a message and everyone see that message uh, please uh, open that Dropbox and choose all panelists and attendees. If you want to send your message uh, without changing that option, your message will be sent only to our panelists and other attendees won't be able to see your messages. So these two uh, points, I, I, I would like to, I would like to uh, point these two points. Uh, going to, to the next uh, faculty, Honestly, it is so hard for me to introduce Professor Norsini uh, in one paragraph and uh, in, in few in few you know uh, sentences. But because of the time, I have no other choice to do so and uh, summarize the introduction in few words and in few sentences. Professor John Norsini, PhD, is a former president and founder of FAMER and has established numerous worldwide initiatives and programs in medical education, research, and data resource development during his 16-year tenure. Before joining FAMER, Dr. Norsini spent 25 years with the American Board of Internal Medicine, serving as Director of Psychometrics, Executive Vice President for Evaluation and Research, and Executive Vice President of the Institute for Clinical Evaluation. Professor Norsini, it is our honor to hand over the floor to you. Thank you. Thank you so much for that. Uh very lovely introduction. I, I very much appreciate it. Um, I, it is really uh, challenging. This is a really challenging time for all of us. And I'm, I'm honored to be part of this and, and honored mostly to be able to learn from Dr. Azim and to learn from the students 
what their experiences are and how we can make this a, a, a better time. As, as Dr. Azim has pointed out, I think eloquently, uh, the thing that concerns us most about the COVID-19 at the moment, of course, is our personal losses, the people who, who are no longer with us uh, as a result of this pandemic. Uh, and he highlighted again with, uh, with beautiful grace uh, the importance of community-based initiatives and the, the importance of, of, of strength and uh, patience during this difficult time. Uh, at the same time, I think I'm very hopeful about this period. Uh, there's a wonderful quote from Winston Churchill who said that you never want to let a good crisis go to waste. Uh, and I am certain that uh, that medical education will not allow this crisis to go to waste. And I, I, I think that, that this is forcing us in many ways from an educational perspective to think about the curriculum, to, to think about the way we're doing assessment uh, and to do those things better as we go forward. Uh, the focus on uh, telemedicine at the moment, uh, I think has, will have long lasting impacts, both for the care of patients, but also uh, for the education of physicians and other healthcare providers. So I think this is an exciting time. And the, the centerpiece to our learning about this and to making it better are the students. Um, it, how you react to this, what you get from this, how we can make this better to, to serve your needs as you go forward to take care of patients is really uh, a critical part of this. So I'm, I'm really delighted to be here today to be able to listen and learn from you. Uh, and to learn from you going forward. So thanks, and I look forward to the discussion. Thank you very much for your great speech. Uh, I really th thank you. Uh, and le let me tell you and tell other attendees that uh, you being here is a great honor for all of us. It, it means a lot to all the students here, your experience, your incredible experience and background in medical education uh, is great support for, for everyone here. Thank you very much. Uh, just uh, for saving the time, I would like to summarize my uh, introduction. Uh, our dear panelists, uh, the floor is yours. The meeting will be moderated by our great faculties. And please do not forget to introduce introduce yourself as the as the floor you know uh, received to you. Uh, Dr. Norsini, the floor is yours, and I would like to hand over the floor to you. Thank you very much and have a great time here. Thank you. So what I'll do is I will read the first question and ask our panelists to respond to it. Um, so the first question is, have there been any new and innovative methods of education and teaching carried out institution during the pan pandemic? And if so, can these methods be used after the pandemic? What should students and faculty do to make these innovations sustainable? So I call on the, the students in order to to, to introduce themselves and to respond, please. Greetings, everyone. Uh, I'm Rina Memete from the Global Surge Organization of Kosovo, and I'm delighted to be amongst you and the renowned professor and doctor. So thank you for having me. Okay, so um, for the question, during these uh, times of pandemic, we have been constantly reminded and aware of the importance of hygiene standards and certain living conditions to um, deal with the pandemic as best as possible. But I think that when it comes to uh, new and innovative methods of education, we should emphasize that um, digitalization has also helped fighting the pandemic. Um, Zoom, Google Hangouts, Skype Meet, uh, Google Classroom, YouTube, teleconferencing, lectures presented on our national televisions, uh, we are some of the innovative methods used in um, our country in Kosovo during the pandemic. And their practical value uh, has rapidly improved from a pre-pandemic period. 
where previously um, these um, methods were considered just an option for quality education and a supplement to traditional schooling systems. Uh, but now they are essential for preserving a progressing society. And uh, these uh, new methods, I think, that can be and should be used after the pandemic and uh, be considered as an essential and not just a luxury of the future. Uh, all schools and universities, uh, particularly in Kosovo, smoothly mastered the sudden transition to homeschooling and uh, easing uh, the adjustment process for students and teachers. And the importance of uh, visualization with COVID-19 foretells the fundamental uh, integration uh, into most learning forms in the near future. So uh, hereby, um, as I think that these kind of methods should be um, used uh, after the pandemic, I think that it is of um, importance to um, maybe mention some of the practical benefits that we can have from a virtual education. And I would like to emphasize three of them, cost efficiency, flexibility, and effectiveness. When it comes to cost, uh, efficiency, I think that it reduces costs uh, by providing access to uh, quality education uh, and uh, on a global scale to people with limited resources, geographical restrictions and physical disabilities also. When it comes to flexibility, um, students can get on demand and lastly when it comes to effectiveness uh, different digital formats can improve learning outcomes and this way increase students engagement by applying a multi-sense approach uh, furthermore investing uh, in virtual education uh, has a powerful positive uh, impact uh, on the socioeconomic uh, aspect which also um, somehow supports the fourth sustainable development goal, uh, because education is directly linked to the global reduction of poverty. And this way, uh, the prevention of children exploitation. So virtual education plays an important role in society uh, by improving access to education, even in the most uh, remote places. And since we are here in session, the International Student Surgical Network, when it comes to what can students and uh, faculty do uh, in terms of surgical residency, uh, residency, I think that this will require innovation, cooperation on the part of surgical residency programs and leadership uh, on the part of our national societies to maintain rigorous standards of education and training for surgical residents. Thank you. That's wonderful, Christina. Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Christina Berkic, and I'm a medical student uh, at the Faculty of Medicine at University of Zagreb, Croatia. Well, our medical faculty has its own online teaching uh, system called the LMS. But before the pandemic, uh, only the minority of professors uh, have used it so far. But uh, now the circumstances have changed a lot and more professors are using it. Well, some of them only upload their point presentations, but some of them organize online lectures, uh, some even organize webinars. Uh, some of them put uh, small tests that every student has to solve. Uh, but some of them are starting uh, to upgrade the system in order to organize uh, written and oral exams using the LMS. Well, uh, also, I would like to say that uh, it depends on a professor because uh, not all of them are uh, enough enthusiastic to use the system, but who wants to work with students and to improve our education has a tool to make it possible. Uh, also, um, I would like to highlight uh, one really um, interesting interactive webinar that is very popular among the students and that was also kind of new idea among our professors. Uh, the webinar is organized by, uh, by our clinic uh, of internal medicine and it's called uh, I'm totally into internal medicine. And uh, the webinar is uh, based on presentation uh, of interesting case studies, so every uh, webinar. 
uh, with a different case study, which is uh, solved by using differential diagnosis um, by the team of our professors. And uh, each professor has a specialty in a different field of internal medicine. And the main goal of this kind of web webinar is to, um, to teach students how to think rationally and uh, to use their entire medical knowledge in order to solve the problem. Well, I think that these methods of online teaching can be, of course, used uh, after the pandemic and especially by our faculty because uh, Zagreb uh, was unfortunately struck by a very uh, heavy earthquake in March and our faculty was uh, quite damaged. So all our faculty buildings, our laboratories, even some hospitals in Zagreb. And when the pandemic will pass, unfortunately, we won't be able to rebuild our buildings and the faculty that quickly. So I think that for the next half a year, maybe even more, we will continue using the online teaching system, at least for some courses, because we really don't know what the future will bring to us in this situation. And thank you. That's, a, that's excellent. These have been two really, really inspiring uh suggestions in, in terms of uh, how we go forward i presume we're going to do summaries at the end so uh, i will turn this over to dr razim for the next question uh thank you so much and also so interesting to me to hear about experiences in other parts of the world because we have the same experiences among our faculty to use LMS, from such a PowerPoint to uh, interactive webinars or sessions. And it's so interesting that all over the world, the experience is the same. And this is the human being. Um, the second question that I like to ask from uh, Nabil and Rina is about the assessment. Uh, and the question is, uh, how will institutions assess the competency of the medical students whose teaching and placements have been compromised due to pandemia? The assessment part of the medical education is uh, severely uh, challenged by uh, COVID-19. Uh, and therefore, I'd like to know your experiences and your ideas about this issue. Thank you. Hi, my name is Nabil. I am from Pakistan. Um, and um, I'm also involved in um, setting up a isolation center here after the pandemic has started. Um, thank you for giving me the opportunity to be part of this webinar. Um, to your kind question, I have thought about um, what competency of medical students should look like and um, how we assess them normally and then how in this situation we are going to assess them and how can we um, adjust for the limitations we have. I think competencies for medical students are not just um, based on skills, but it's also about emotional competency about competency as a professional, as a doctor. Um, one of the major things that I've seen in the pandemic is, you see, students were really passionate about helping people and finding ways of contributing. That's one competency that you can easily assess um, by seeing a willingness to be involved. When it comes to emotional competency, you see how um, in such stressful situations, anyone who is uh, on a rotation in, in, a, in a COVID ICU or a COVID HDU or somewhere he was not supposed to be displaced, how do they interact um, with their faculty? Uh, do they adjust themselves to be useful? Because we've seen that in our field isolation center, when we called out for volunteers, a lot of medical students came in just to help out with um, routine stuff, you know, how to like move linen 
in and out of the in and out of the board, um, how to manage HR, you know, learned a lot of various things. So that's 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 an assessment of emotional competency. As far as um, people who are in routine medical school are concerned, I think um, LMS has been mentioned quite a bit. Uh, it's growing here in Pakistan as well, and uh, what we're seeing is that we are getting more and more advanced with it. We have institutions with, which provide logins. All of the lectures are being recorded and shared online. People are given pre-test and post-test so that they can assess their growth. Uh, and um, I guess um, that's how we deal with the, the limitation we have of physical distancing. Um, growth is necessary. We need to move forward. We cannot look for the ideal methods. We just have to manage ourselves in the current situation. All of us know how uh, the U.S. has, for example, stopped Step 2 CK because, uh, you know, is it really worth it um, in the situation where people have to travel around the world to, uh, you know, assess, the, assess themselves? Um, so we just need to settle for what we can and keep innovating. Uh, there's no perfect answer for this, but that's my, uh, these are my two cents. Thank you. Thank you so much. And what about Re, uh, what about Rina? Uh, thank you, doctor. Um, when it comes to uh, the whole period of this pandemic. I think that we must consider this as an event or as a reset point and an opportunity to transform the medical education uh, overall. And why this crisis, I mean, the, the situation, new reality continues without us knowing an end point. Uh, I think that it is important to uh, develop creative ways of assessment that continue to maintain, most importantly, the standards of medical education and accommodate uh, at the same uh, time uh, the present environmental and social limitations that have been brought on by COVID-19. I think it is also important to uh, first consider the existing framework of assessment and then uh, work backwards on designing and replanning it. So as a first step would be to, uh, to add multiple opportunities for formative assessment into the new approaches adapted for teaching and learning that we uh, mentioned previously from our experiences. So uh, standard assessment formats in medical school um, that we are used to include written exams. Uh, and these will need to be uh, re-planned and redesigned. And somehow this whole situation uh, offers an opportunity to transition programs to a competency-based program or a curriculum. What does this mean? It means that uh, students will not just acquire knowledge and then spit it back at the time of a final exam, but instead the method of assessment is formative rather than summative and uh, we as students would be evaluated on how we apply our knowledge to clinical situations that uh, we as future physicians uh, might face in the future. So this regular and consistent feedback online would give students more direction and assume responsibility of their own learning journeys. Um, the key task uh, in such a situation, I think that it will be the timely creation and monitoring of a balanced face-to-face an online assessment program, keeping in mind always the resource availability, faculty buy-in and support of regulatory and licensing bodies. I think that uh, it is important uh, to um, emphasize the programs that include visual patients. Uh, these are great programs that value uh, the knowledge application, um, based on different scenarios in clinical reasoning, as well as students' critical thinking. Uh, our organization, the Global Surgery Organization of Kosovo, has just recently had a project uh, where we uh, collaborated with um, a platform uh, 
that used visual patients and we organized that project in form of training. We trained a, a great number of medical students. And uh, after the project, we did an evaluation form and 100% uh, of the participants agreed on including visual patients programs in the curriculum. And they also uh, expressed the experience uh, of being part of that uh, activity was very beneficial for, for them. Um, lots of visual patient programs exist already, but I think that it should be um, better if uh, there uh, are visual patient programs developed locally, because that would make uh, possible to depict regional diseases based on their patterns, and uh, this way would make learning and assessment more contextual. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, I uh, wrote it down some comments from uh, both our uh, great students, but I follow my senior uh, um, uh, faculty, the professor Narsini, who is so humble that uh, lets me to talk first. And therefore, I, I, I prefer to postpone my comments because I, I, I like to use more from your comments to, and to learn from your comments. And, I'm, and I assure you that I would provide some comments from our sides uh, to you. Therefore, I, I think that these are your turn. My turn? Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I thought, I thought it was very nice that you said senior and not older. Thank you very much, uh, my good friend. Um, so uh, we're, we'll move on to the third question and we'll hear from Christina and Julia for this. Uh, do you think the way we deliver medical education needs to adapt after this pandemic? And how do you envision this change taking place in your region? So Christina. Uh, thank you, Professor. Well, uh, I don't know for the region, but I can speak for Croatia. Oh, well, uh, I think that uh, it should adapt in order to um, start clinical part of education again, because uh, when the pandemic starts, uh, this part of our education just stopped because students were not allowed to enter hospitals, not only for the educational purposes, but also in order to help. So if you are, let's say, a senior year student and you would like to help during the pandemic and uh, also to improve your skills or something like that during that period, you were not allowed to participate, not in any kind of way. So all our education was online and using books and other teaching materials. But in my opinion, no books or webinars or online teaching can completely replace the time spent with the patient. And I think that now we lack that part of our education. And uh, again, some of our professors have started to open their departments from students in order to perform a clinical part of education, but uh, only again, just a few of them. Uh, that also depends on clinics because every um, clinical universal, universal, universal hospital, hospital has uh, its own rules. And some of them still don't allow students in, inside. Some of them do allow. So the situation is uh, um, in a mess, let's say it's like that, uh, regarding that part of our education. But my opinion is that we should start spending our time in hospitals with the patients again, because otherwise uh, we would seriously lack like that part. One, one day when we will become doctors. So this is really an important part. Thank you. Thank you. And Julia, I believe you're next. Thank you, Professor. I'm a final year medical student in Münster in Germany, and I'm the chair of Incision Germany and board member of the German Society for Global Surgery. And related to the topic of the webinar, my university converted all teaching activities to online lectures, I think in the beginning of April. So by now I've got some experience with uh, COVID-19 education. Uh, thank you very much for having me 
in this webinar and for allowing me to speak. Uh, regarding the question, I think, um, like Christina mentioned, broadly speaking, the most important thing at the moment is to return to our usual teaching methods. Because no one was prepared before COVID-19 um, to get involved into online teaching, a lot of our usual training sessions could not take place, or at least not in a way that was as efficient as they usually are. For example, in my universities, all practical lessons were converted into theoretical lectures online, and all hands-on teaching, of course, could not be offered. Furthermore, students had to study by themselves in isolation, and I think it is important to return to studying in groups to ensure the mental well-being of our medical students in large. However, I do think that we can learn from our teaching experience in COVID-19 times. First of all, we learned that we need to be prepared for crises like these, um, because they could, we hope they won't, but they could um, come again in the future. And we need to be able to react to those crises by being more flexible in our teaching methods. I think we also saw that being more flexible in teaching methods and assessments and just more flexible in reg regulations was an enrichment for our teaching in general. And that these could be used, for example, if students aren't able to take class in physical, uh, take part in physical teachings because they have to stay at home with children or relatives or have to spend some time abroad or in their home play, home city. And this could give them an opportunity to still stay connected with their medical school and curriculum. But flexible teaching methods can also help to improve our usual teaching methods. Online studying tools that were mentioned before, videos on YouTube um, or online courses can help students to better understand the disease while they're studying and could be an additional resource we offer our medical students in the future. Another thing I think we can learn is that we need to focus more on teaching our students to think out of the box of the diseases we are used to. Like it was mentioned before, this can help us be better clinicians by focusing more on patients as a whole, as opposed to relying on facts we learn from textbooks. But it can also prepare us for a time when we might face another new disease or pandemic in the future like this one. So in conclusion, I think as soon as it's responsible to do so, depending on the place we all live in, we should return to our, the teaching methods we know and physical um, lectures and especially clinical teaching, as was mentioned before. However, we should keep in mind what we learned from this pandemic and integrate the advantages of the teaching we are doing now into our regular medical curriculum. Thank you. Thank you both. That's a, a wonderful wrap up on this question. You've done, done a great job and we will come to it at the end and have a more conversation about this. So I will turn it over to my young colleague, Dr. Azim. <laughs> Thank you so much. Uh, the uh, next question is so interesting to me, and I think that uh, Nabil talked about it uh, oh, during the first question, and it was about the uh, attendance of uh, COVID-19 wars or isolation wars by medical students. And the question now from Julia and Nabil is about the, do you think it's necessary to plan specific clinical rotations in COVID-19 wars for students and why? Your answer might be yes, your answer might be no, and therefore I'd like to know why uh, is your answer to this complex question. Thank you. Julia? Um, yes. Thank you, Doctor. Um, I think experience in the work in a COVID-19 war can be a very useful experience for medical students. I started working in a COVID-19 ICU in March during an outbreak within the hospital, so there were a lot of very sick patients to treat and the working conditions were quite stressful. Usually, when there is no pandemic, I enjoy, enjoy rotations more, which allow me to work quite independently with types of cases that can be managed by a medical student with supervision of a doctor. Of course, working in the COVID-19 ICU is very different. The conditions the patients showed were too complex for me as a medical student to manage. But still, this one was one of the most interesting times I spent in a hospital. 
uh, during my studies. As medical students, we're used to learning things off by heart and to try to compare the symptoms we see in a patient with the facts we learned. If we don't know what to do, we ask a more senior person who will be able to tell us because they have more clinical experience. If they aren't sure, they will get help from their seniors who have even more clinical experience and so on. But it was very different during the early days of COVID-19 on our ward. No one really knew the disease. No one had COVID-19 related clinical experience. We got new regulations, new treatment guidelines, new rules for PPE almost every hour. Many COVID patients reacted differently to the regular ICU treatment options like ventilation or medication than the patients everyone was used to. And this led to for me, a unique experience that everyone in the team was almost at the same level of knowledge, at least regarding the care for COVID-19 patients. And therefore, I've never before experienced an almost non-existent hierarchy in a medical ward in Germany before. Everyone's ideas were appreciated, from medical students to physiotherapists to experienced ICU nurse or ICU senior attendings. For me, that was so interesting to see how even senior attendings had to learn from scratch how to treat this disease and how everyone learned together with everyone else which treatment and care options are the most useful ones in this case. But although I do think that the experience, uh, experiencing the work on COVID-19 wards is a great, for a great opportunity for medical students, uh, I don't think we will be able to ensure that every student can spend a rotation on such a ward. At least in Germany, there aren't enough COVID wards to allow every medical student in all university to rotate through one. And also, still by now, there's not enough staff on the wards uh, to ensure good teaching for all their students. But I do think wherever possible, students should be allowed to spend a rotation on COVID-19 ward. It's a unique situation which we can utilize to broaden our horizons and the horizons of our future doctors to think out of the boxes we have learned of by heart from our textbooks and to learn how to react to an unknown disease. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, you talk about uh, some some sort of, for example, electives for being in COVID-19 wars. And I like to know more about uh, Nabil's ideas about this issue. But I like to know your idea about is it uh, sh should it be a necessary or mandatory course? Uh, uh, should it be uh, as providing care for the patient or just for training of medical students uh, to handle the COVID-19? What's your idea? So I'll speak from my experience. I've kind of shifted to management of uh, healthcare while in the past two years. And um, even in this uh, pandemic, I ended up managing the HR for the field isolation center in one of the biggest cities of the country, which is Karachi. We have 200 mil 20 million people out of the 200 million people of the country living in one city. And uh, we are actually setting up an HDU, uh, a high dependency unit as well. Um, I was responsible for looking at HR. Um, we were depending on uh, doctors from the government and we were depending on doctors who were volunteer volunteering and also on medical students who were volunteering. Um, and in our country, we faced this challenge where we were limited in the human resource we had. Uh, so about whether we should be making these com uh, these rotations compulsory i think for us um as um, medical doctors as a medical community our principles are very clear and and should be very clear um they're based on ethical principles of beneficence non-maleficence autonomy um and based on those three i think it's about making sure that whatever duty you give to the medical student is something that does not harm the patient and does not harm the medical student mentally, physically. Um, knowing a patient, a student, if you put that student in a uh, COVID ICU and it might mentally affect him, do you have contingency plans to manage that? It's very important. Um, there's also an aspect of autonomy. Uh, 
a lot of these medical students have a lot of pressure from families about um, whether they can go inside or, you know, whether their families are comfortable with that. I think what we really need to think about is how we structure our medical education and how we structure our uh, society overall. Um, we need to motivate people to be more serving. Uh, we need to give incentives where, uh, which are not just uh, monetary, but also incentives that speak to moral responsibility in medical education. Um, and yeah, I mean, definitely give them the opportunity, let them come in, see how far they can go. Don't make it compulsory, push them, uh, motivate them through your, uh, by taking the lead. I think um, that, that goes a long way. If you are nice to them, if you show that you care for them, through not just words, but also through actions about, through policies, uh, through incentives. These kids are supposed to be the future of your um, country's, you know, the medical community, a very important part of the society. You just have to make sure that the opportunity that comes with challenges, you make good use of it. Um, we've done, uh, we've had a, Healthcare assistants, we term them as healthcare assistants. We have nurses who are, um, who are to be nurses basically um, in their fifth year and they're supposed to be doing nothing because they're not going to their classes. Classes have been postponed, exams have been postponed. Same with the medical students and they end up coming, out, us, coming to us and we find something for them to do uh, within the ward if they want, outside the ward if they want, and uh, we make good use of them. So I think, yeah. Uh, it should be there. It should be left to the options of uh, the student autonomy. And then also just make sure that you're not harming the student and you're not harming the system and the uh, patients. Those are my thoughts. Thank you so much. The fourth one is justice uh, after beneficence and non maleficence and autonomy. And it's so interesting to me that to, you use these four principles, not only for patients, but also for students. It's so interesting. And I think about and I'm curious about the, how we could provide balance among implication of these four principles on both sides for a healthcare provider and for patient and caregiver. Uh, we could be back. Uh, to this uh, to this challenging topic uh, somewhere later. Uh, thank you, thank you so much for both of you because the question is so challenging, and you tried your best to provide uh, honest in, uh, answer on the shoes of students. Thank you so much. Okay, on to question five uh, for Rena and Julia. This is uh, this has been just for from my perspective a wonderful listening uh, to everyone, and uh, I've learned quite a bit. And there's still more to go. Uh, so the 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 next question is: What advice would you give to students who are finding it difficult to study during this pandemic? And as you talk about that, if you could identify also why it's difficult to study, why some students find it challenging to study during this time, that'd be helpful as well. So I look forward to your answers. And I guess, Rena, yours, you are up first. Thank you, Professor. OK, so I would like to start answering this question by quoting one of the novelists and, uh, who inspires me every day, especially uh, when it comes to studying and reach my goals professionally. She is Marie Curie, and she says, um, nothing in life is to be feared, it is only to be understood. And uh, regarding your question, I think that uh, this new reality is really uh, challenging and confusing for most of the students to adapt to uh, new approaches and new methods of education. Uh, so on the other hand, um, we as medical students or newly graduate are in the best position, I think, to understand the situation. and. Uh, the whole that the whole world is going through so as long as we become more conscious of the situation and we uh, look at the positive sides then that would make 
uh, easier for us to take advantage of the new approaches and methods uh, used for education. Thank you. Thank you, Julia. Thank you, Professor. Um, I think one of the points where it's difficult to study at this difficult time, not only in medical school, but also in other parts of university, is just the general way of life we're experiencing the, these times. We're not allowed to see our friends. We're not allowed to meet in groups in universities, stay together at lectures, go to lunch together. So. Um, life as a student and as a medical student as well changed a lot compared to a few months ago. So I think one of the most important points is don't isolate yourself. I think we should all stay, try to stay in contact with friends and family, even if this can only happen online or by phone, depending on where you live at the moment. I think that's one of the most important points because medical school can be very tough in a normal times uh, without a pandemic, but it's even more difficult right now. So I think if you feel like medical school is getting too much or that it can't be handled or that you're not suitable for medicine or for medical school, which I think are all very normal feelings we all had or all have during medical school. But normally we can discuss with friends and family uh, where, because they can see that we don't feel well. I think we should talk to our friends before we think about quitting because these are very, difficult times and many of the feelings we have might be influenced by the pandemic or by the way we're experiencing university at the moment. So although there are normal feelings in normal times, they might be more challenging at the moment. So I think it's important to stay in contact with people who know, know us better. And I think if you can, we should all try to support our community coping COVID-19 in any way we can made by working in hospitals if it's possible and if we feel safe doing so, or um, helping with other uh, parts of community service, because I think this can help us feel less helpless and feel less alone. And also, I think it's good at the, in these challenging times to see how the community is working together and to be a part of it. I think many students also might not have support, the support of their university. Some of us have described like online lectures or other online courses that we can use. I think we as students need to become more creative in the way we study medicine in these times. So if your university doesn't offer online lectures, doesn't offer a special uh, pandemic <laughs> medical curriculum, um, maybe you can use one of the other um, devices that were already talked about today, like online lectures. Other universities might provide uh, to other students or there are several apps that we can use to better understand um, pathologies or other medical like operations. And there are YouTube videos where people explain to you, maybe in a better way than just looking in a, on a PowerPoint slide without having anyone explaining it to you. Um, and there are webinars like these or online classes that you can take. So you should try to keep focused on your medical education, even if you need to be more creative about it than in usual times. And then I think it's very important to mention that if you don't feel well, if you feel lonely or if you aren't safe at home, which is also, I think, a big problem in the world right now, you should seek help. I'm, I hope and I'm sure most universities have people you can talk to and who can support you to find the help you need. And that can also be the case if you're having financial troubles uh, that uh, don't allow you to uh, study medicine the way you're used to. Maybe because you cannot work in the place you usually work in or your family cannot support you the way they usually do. But I think the most important thing is just for everyone to stay connected with their friends and with fellow incision members and whoever it is to give, uh, that give you strength and uh, hope to overcome these challenging times. Thank you. Thank you both. This is really actually very moving in, in many ways and, and really highlights the importance of peers as part of the educational process. So I, I appreciate both of your comments and we'll turn it over to Dr. Azim for the next question. Um, thank you. And the last question in this part, 
sorry. Uh, the last question in this part is about the a major issue uh, about the inequality in medical education. Uh, the question is, uh, some people believe that the pandemic has further highlighted inequalities in medical education. Uh, I, I watched uh, and I reviewed the, uh, the Q&A section of the webinar and found a question about how we could do in low-income countries to face the challenges of uh, medical education during this pandemic. And I, I think that this question is related to the question that are now I'm asking from uh, Christina and Nabil about um, some people believe that the pandemic has further highlighted inequalities in medical education. Uh, what do you think about this statement uh, in regards to your own experiences and knowledge within medical education? What's your feeling about this important issue? Thank you, doctor. Well, I definitely think that it has highlighted the inequalities, especially, uh, especially between the high-income countries, middle-income countries, and low-income countries because this situation showed us that it is really valuable and really important to have uh, different kinds of online teaching systems and tools. But again, it is really, really heavy for every student to be isolated, to be alone, and again, to have to study only using books. Of course, all of us can use um, some additional materials like uh, YouTube videos and stuff like that, but we also rely on our professors. And it is also challenging and I believe dif difficult to them to organize lectures and to follow curriculum if you don't have a proper tool to deal with it. But again, I think that it depends on each and every professor because there are again some other tools that we use in our everyday life like I don't know like Skype or like Zoom or even FaceTime that they can maybe use to organize lectures or um, maybe just to record themselves um, holding lecture maybe by their, by their mobile phones or something like that and then to email that to their students to organize uh, lectures in a way that is uh, acceptable to all of them. And I would also like to encourage uh, all these students, if their professors haven't organized anything, and maybe they're not thinking about that, about how important it is for students to have that kind of lectures, just to reach out to their professors or their senior colleagues. And I believe that then they will think of something, they will try to make some videos or I don't know, PowerPoint presentations, anything that could be helpful, some additional learning materials, and that all of us can lear learn something from this situation and to gain some extra knowledge to keep fighting on with this pandemic and our education. Thank you. What, uh, uh, thank you very much. And uh, Nabil, what's your idea about this question? What's your feeling about it? I agree with the statement that it's definitely highlighted inequalities in medical education. Um, and rightly so, because any um, system that is not stretched will hide a lot of uh, inequalities. Um, but when you stretch it out and you see the burden increasing, you you see the tears and in, 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 in the fabric of uh, of that system. Um, I'll make it very simple. I just have to look around and see what conversations I've had with my friends who have been medical students and private colleges and. In, and people who have been medical students in public colleges, um, some are some some of these colleges we know are good, others we know are not that good. Um, the basic like discussions about how some know programmatic management experience as medical students, others don't, 
you have people who ha have had communication skill sessions in which they've been able to do you know um, breaking bad news um, others haven't you have people who have had simulation experience um, and had cpr classes on on mannequins others have just seen that in theory um, you have people who have had experience going into wards with faculty uh, during nights, others never had a night call. You know, those are things that we see and and, and you, you also have these uh, differences like where you know some are more motivation motivated because of the people that they've worked with uh, who have more moral grounding others who never got the chance to interact with those people and their faculty did not instill in them motivation and those emotional skills to deal with um, medical education with, with stressful situations in medicine research experience cultural sensitivities you see that like it's not something that is uh, hidden in normal days and in this situation definitely it's showing that um, a majority of uh, students and doctors who have come from um, public sector or from you know medical education medical schools um, that are not um, fully capable have lagged behind in this and the question is why so what what is different for them that they didn't get what some people received in medical education um is that something to do with the place they were born in the financial status of their family uh what you know constructs of society affected them and how they affected them and the context is the same talk about healthcare access talk about access to education talk about um is just being questioning the roots of society questioning uh what we're doing wrong as human beings um of not giving opportunity not being fair with giving opportunity not taking care of everyone and just caring about ourselves those are the roots of the problems um and definitely need to be addressed on an individual level on a on an institutional level on a country level um I mean, definitely one of the biggest uh, gaps I've seen is programmatic management. We as doctors do not know what it takes to think about things pro programmatically through, you know, the workforce that how do you interact with people? How do you plan your deliverables? Um, most of us here on this panel definitely have had that experience, but, you know, a lot of other uh, students I've seen, they don't. Um, that's that for me has been the biggest biggest uh, medical education inequality that I've struggled with. Uh, I feel burdened. I feel like if I had more colleagues who could do it, I would be much more easier in my in my skin and in my um, activities. So those are my thoughts. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much. Thank you. I, I think that we are uh, closing to the over to the end of this um, session but before that uh, we we need to have some advice from our senior faculty members in the panel about uh, i think that the question one question two three four five six are so interesting and uh we could uh, enjoy about the more elaboration of these questions Uh, so I do. We want to take questions from the audience first, or I'm happy to 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 pick up two or three points that I thought were there were many wonderful points, but there are two or three that 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 really sort of jumped out at me uh, as I listened to this. The the first and probably most important point is that there's no perfect answer uh, to all of these questions. These are a series of really challenging issues. Uh, and there are no answers that work for everyone. Um, but I think there are a couple of three things that do jump out. One is, one is that uh, to the degree that we can shift 
some of the education as appropriate uh, to various sorts of online platforms. Uh, I think uh, one of the panelists talked about uh, doing that for purposes of cost, flexibility, effectiveness, and access. I think they're really key points and they, they will, if we can work along those lines, address to some small degree uh, the inequalities that we just that were just discussed, um, and that is a, that's a troubling issue. Uh, it's a troubling issue in high-income countries as well. I mean, in in my own country, where inequalities are vast, uh, we don't necessarily uh, do a very good job making sure that everyone has access to educational materials, and educational experiences. And as a consequence, I think that's a that's a really important point and a really important sensitivity, and increasing uh, access to to online resources. I think is a is an important way to address this everywhere. Um, second thing that sort of jumped out at me is that to me is that um, uh, the uh, interest in replanning the curriculum that's occurred now because of this. It's really absolutely critical to, at the same time, replan the assessment. I know many medical schools that I'm familiar with have, have worked on the curriculum and then have just sort of shrugged their shoulders and said, well, assessment will get tagged on at the end. I think this is a wonderful opportunity to fix and to correct and to make better both the curriculum and the assessment and make sure that the assessment supports learning. Uh, and also also assures that that learning has happened. So I think there's a real opportunity here. Um, I think that that the issues around patient contact are are uh, really critical, and I don't think that there's any way to address them necessarily. Although I would, there were several hopeful remarks about hierarchy and the hierarchy going away and being able to have real conversations among the various professionals caring for patients, and I think that's. A spectacular, a spectacular uh, insight. Uh, and the, the last thing I'll say, because I know we're we're running out of time and we have other important things to talk about, is that the the importance of peer relationships. I think was you've really highlighted in a spectacular way. Um, and I think I think it's really critical that your relationships with each other are a large part of the educational process. And I think that we probably don't highlight them enough, uh, except for moments like this. And so as I was saying, as I was thinking about this, there's one other thing I want to say, and that is that it's really critical that the faculty uh, get up to date on the sorts of technology that, uh, that is needed in this setting. Um, we've been dragged along kicking and screaming, especially those of us who are a little further along. Uh, in terms of adopting these these kind of techniques, but it's really incumbent upon us to make this a better process by learning the technology, by adapting our teaching uh, to the, the kinds of situations that we're talking about now. Thanks. Over to you, sir. Yes. Thank you so much. Uh, about the question one, I think that the uh, the question is, what is about uh, what happened after COVID-19. Hopefully, uh, comes to an end. And uh, what happened after that for medical education? Uh, I feel that uh, many things will will change. But at the same time, I, I I believe that there is a powerful trend for turning to pre-pandemic condition. Uh, the, the resistance has ruined by the um, disaster and by the uh, crisis. And some people believe that uh, we need to change our current practice just to rescue the medical education during the pandemic. And after closing the the file of this pandemic, we need to return to the pre-pandemic behavior and practice. I'm not sure it is good, I'm not sure it is bad, but I believe that uh, we need to provide um, more energy uh, to 
promote the dialogue between both sides to uh, figure out uh, what the uh, the benefits of uh, uh, this pandemic for medical education and we should uh, save it for the future and th uh, and therefore i'm not sure that everything goes well after the uh, pandemic we should we should be cautious about saving the benefits and we should uh, work hardly to save these uh, benefits. About the question two, uh, I am totally agree that uh, with, I totally agree with uh, Nabil that you know, there are a lot of opportunities for assessment. Uh, because because usually we think about medical education as biomedical science, uh, some sort of knowledge and skills. But uh, more importantly, uh, how to handle an uncertain situation. It's a competency for medical students and for practitioners. And, and, and during pandemic, this pandemic, it's a great opportunity to assess it. Uh, and also about the next question about the um, the students that uh, feel hard to study as another competency that is so important about personal development. Personal development are more uh, uh, important than before in uh, a competency framework and medical education. How we handle ourselves, how we could provide a balance between work and uh, personal life, how we could cope with the anger or sadness uh, or, in, or grief. Uh, and we, we, we should uh, empower our students in these regards and therefore I believe that uh, assessment of these competencies are so important and there are a lot of opportunities. But, and we, we and you talk, uh, Nabil and also uh, one of our colleagues, talk about the importance of assessment for learning, not just assessment of learning. Uh, and also about talking about programmatic assessment. It's so important. and. As uh, Professor Nursini talked about, the importance of uh, thinking more, because I, I believe that the usually assessment is the weakest point. Not, not, not I'm sure that the weakest point, but one of the weakest points in our curriculum that not support the teaching and learning uh, revisions that we put in our curriculum, and therefore we could use it. About the question, for, uh, I'm not sure, three or four. I think that the question four, uh, I'm, I'm, uh, it's so interesting to me that Nabil talked about the four ethical principles and he used it for uh, analyzing the behavior of students because he talked about the uh, beneficence of being in rotations, clinical rotations for students, the non maleficence for medical students, yes. Uh, um, usually I heard about these principles on the side of patient and the, and the side of uh, caregiver. Because, because uh, inherently medicine has put the risk on the side of physicians. And this is the fundamental uh, principle of medicine as a profession to put the needs of the patient first, yes. Um, and and I, I think that it's related heavily on the, when we believe that a medical student is a physician, when he uh, read the uh, oath, when he started, his hair or his clinical rotations when she or he started the medical school. 
if the answer is after graduation, it could not be an obligatory obligation to medical student to provide care in COVID-19 wars. But if it is a transition, gradual transition, just after the beginning of medical school, it could be a duty for medical students to provide care at the level that they could provide. I'm not sure that it's true because as uh, you know, uh, you may know that there is an open letter from Professor Cantor, the chief editor of academic medicine, to new uh, coming medical students. And he asked new coming medical students, when you are a physician, and when you started your career as a physician, and when you sh should be committed to the principles of profession of medicine. And this is a hard question. And everybody should answer by himself or herself to this question. And therefore, I, I agree with you, Nabil. That it's not just a pressure, and we should not just put pressure on medical students to go to the COVID-19 wards. Uh, but we should think about it and we should ask them to think about it because it's uh, a good opportunity to think about the role of the medical students for providing care. Sorry for uh, some lengthy talk. Uh, about the, about the uh, question five, I think networking is a very good option. And this is the reason that I believe that just putting something and some educational material on the LMS is not sufficient. Some people ask me why you are insist on uh, online teaching and some sort of some sort of webinars. I, I tell them that it's not so important that you provide the information by offline presentation or online. The most important issue for online lectures or online webinars is the interaction of medical students with their faculty members and feeling that we are a part of a community. We are socially, we are physically distanced from each other, but now we are in a room, even virtual room, that could hear from uh, our colleagues. Uh, we could see each other, and this is uh, so important to maintain the mental health of medical students. And therefore, uh, I think that the teaching methods could provide some sort of support for them. And uh, about the medical inequalities, medical education inequalities, I found that uh, medical education inequalities is, as Nabil talk, uh, is inherently exist in our medical education. Even in a single country, we could see that among different uh, medical schools, among different medical students. And I think that COVID-19 some, somehow provide a good opportunity. For example, many, uh, many, uh, systems uh, provided free uh, resources, education resources during the COVID-19 pandemic for low-coming countries. And therefore, I, I, I'm sure that the medical inequalities uh, reinforced during the COVID-19 pandemic, but some good points exist. In it. Sorry for this lengthy talk. Thank you very much, Professor Norsini. Thank you very much, Dr. Mirza Zadeh. Thank you, every panelist. Uh, let me tell you something. Uh, during this discussion, I had been receiving lots of messages on the, behind the scene, and uh, everyone was saying that, wow, this webinar is surprising. I'm, I'm surprised by, you know, uh, quotes, by, you know, uh, answers, and especially the point of views and honestly everyone are enjoying this uh, everyone is enjoying this webinar and uh, let me tell you after th three uh, after five webinars 
end this year. Let me tell you that this webinar is, I think, is the most incredible webinar that I've ever had. And uh, your answers, your point of views, your uh, attitudes are really great. Uh, we still have, oh, we actually don't have uh, enough time, but uh, the point is that we started a little late, so I would appreciate it if you stayed with us uh, for maybe 20 minutes more. And I apologize again because of the delay in the beginning of the session. Uh, let's go to, to the Q&A part and see uh, what questions are asked by uh, our attendees. The first question, uh, I think, is answered by dear Rena. Thank you, Rena, for answering the question. I hope that everyone has seen the answers. Uh, I also re asked the question uh, if anyone else would like to uh, give an answer and complete uh, Rena's answer. The question is what can be the solution to educational problems in this pandemic in lower middle income countries where technologies aren't much advanced, part of country. Uh, and parts of country don't have proper internet access. I think that this uh, question were asked to during the discussion, but if uh, anyone has any more answer, please turn on your microphone and add your answers to the previous one and Arena's. If I may jump in, um, I think Rina's answer was very comprehensive. Thank you, Rina, for that. Uh, and thank you, everyone, for a wonderful panel today. Um, it, it's been very educational for myself as well. And I, I also have been receiving a lot of great messages about today's webinar. Uh, in terms of internet accessibility uh, as a whole, this has been something that has been coming up quite a bit within our network and within the different types of work that we are doing, getting engaged in some telemedicine types of work through Students for COVID partnership that we have uh, with Incision. Uh, what I have recently come to learn that is that um, there are technologies now available that uh, can enhance internet accessibility at very low cost. And I think um, disseminating information about that is very helpful. Um, I had heard that there are um, small boxes, this is how it was explained to me, that you can uh, place in different um, locations that are very cheap and they can give um, really good access to internet in um, vast areas. This is coming uh, up as a technology improvement as results of um, the COVID pandemic because a lot of regions are now relying heavily on telemedicine, especially low resource regions that are remote and don't have access to hospitals or can't travel uh, quite far. Uh, I think it would be great if we can actually get details and information about this and post it on Students for COVID and Incision channels so that this is something that is known and hopefully can be expanded to improve both education and access to healthcare. Thank you very much, Kathy. And if anyone has found any information about those small and cheap boxes, please inform me. Uh, I think I should change my internet here and I, I, I really need those small and cheap boxes. Uh, thank you. Uh, any other thoughts, any other experience? Professor Norsini, you have seen and visited many countries in the past years. And uh, what have you seen regarding this problem in different countries? So I think this is a, it's a really good question and a really important issue. Uh, there is very low connectivity in many places where the foundation worked uh, when I was there. And we ended up developing materials that were downloadable uh, so that it didn't require uh, synchronous access to information. Uh, so that's one strategy that I think can be useful is to, to, to have materials that can just simply be downloaded so somebody can find their way to an internet cafe and, and download what needs to be downloaded. So that's, that's one potential solution. Second is that here in the, the US, uh, there are actually large parts of the country without internet access. And, and what some of the groups have is to create hotspots 
to which the students are invited uh, and parents take their kids uh, to the hotspot. They park in the parking lot uh, because they can't be outside the car, or they can't be together in any way, uh, but then within six feet of each other. But that's another alternative is to begin to create these sorts of nodes that, uh, that might be useful. So I think there, there are some strategies going forward. I think this is an absolutely critical issue because it relates very directly to the inequities certainly within my country, but, but I think around the world in terms of access to information. So I think solving this problem will, will solve many more problems than just uh, health care. I think there are a variety of issues that has the potential. Thank you, Dr. Kelly. Thank you very much, Professor Norsi, for your uh, answer. Uh, the, the fact is, you know, is that uh, dealing with this kind of problems are difficult, but uh, it's not impossible. Uh, in each situation, we can find a solution, you know, uh, fit, that, fit that situation. Uh, thank you very much for your answer. Going to the next question. Uh, there is a question that uh, asking, when will hospitals reopen during COVID-19? for stagers and medical students. There are two points about this question. First of all, the definition of stagers, externs, or if I'm not wrong, preclerkship as students uh, is different in different countries and different universities. And the second point is that I, I feel that this question is asking for news, not, uh, not a very technical uh, answer, but I would appreciate our panelists if uh, you have any idea and opinion about the appropriate time for opening the opening universities. Um. I think in most of the healthcare systems and hospitals around the world, um, medical students and residents have become like an important component of care. Residents definitely, uh, interns also. And um, it's not like because it's a pandemic, people are not getting sick of other things. Um, and it's not like our demand for healthcare workers is not increasing. Uh, we see that a lot of these healthcare workers who are working in COVID are getting affected. So we need a lot of backup. Um, and uh, we need people to be efficient, proficient. We don't want them to, you know, stay out. Uh, so using all of the relevant PPE, we should definitely, in all countries, try to push for quick resumption of um, on-site training, clinical training. And I think that's what we are doing here in Pakistan. Thank you, Nabil. Uh, Catherine, you just opened your microphone. So I had a... Um... I don't know if I would say it's a question or a point, uh, maybe both. Something that I've seen um, coming up within different uh, webinars within uh, interactions, again, through Students for COVID, is that some schools have been incorporating their clinical students in telemedicine solutions, in triaging over the phone, uh, especially for walking well. Um, and some have done actually a very successful job with that. I know it was done in Italy, uh, in a few other European countries to uh, EMSA and uh, Feinberg um, School of Medicine also has a similar program that we're evaluating for possible international collaboration for incision. Um, do you see a role for that and preparations that we can do for that before um, the next phase of the pandemic, because we all know there is another wave coming. Uh, and do you think that could be an educational opportunity in addition to incorporating this workforce um, in, into the care of the COVID patients? Thank you very much, Kathleen. Uh, regarding that experience that uh, you mentioned, uh, we already did that. Uh, program in Iran involving students uh, in telemedicine. And as I know, uh, Dr. Mirza Zada was one of the, uh, you know, organizer of this program, or, in this program in uh, Imam Khomeini Hospital. 
And uh, I don't know if Dr. Mirzazadeh, would you like to uh, give a talk about this experience involving the students in this kind of programs? Yes, thank you. I, I, I was uh, uh, involved, but not uh, directly in charge or responsible because uh, we, uh, we really admire our students to be involved in this process. Uh, as a sidetrack, I, I saw the interaction uh, in WhatsApp by the senior faculty members. It's so interesting to me because when, uh, when the COVID-19 uh, pandemic and epidemic uh, started in Iran, uh, in late February, uh, we had uh, each 24 hours, we had uh, more than 800 patients uh, visited in respiratory triage in the hospital and nearly 70 patients admitted each night and therefore we should uh, we should open uh, each night uh, a ward as uh, covid-19 ward uh, and finally it reached to 400 patients 100 patients in icus uh, and 300 patients in wards, more than 10 wards allocated for COVID-19 patients. And we found that it's so difficult to admit uh, all the patients with uh, borderline symptoms. Otherwise, the, uh, the system uh, shut down. And therefore, we, we started uh, some sort of um, admission criteria uh, that lead to uh, many patients could receive the care, the supportive care at home. Yes. And we are concerned about the progression of the disease. And we started an um, online panel. Uh, each, uh, for each patient, we have a report that provides the uh, cell phone number or uh, phone number. And for high-risk patients, active follow-up by our students, usually students. Uh, and they are connected uh, behind the scene in a WhatsApp group by the faculty members and some practitioners and some residents. And they receive consultation from, and, and the, the patient know that they are students, they are not licensed practitioner, but they could provide consultation, they, uh, they could provide follow-up, and uh, those patients who need to come back to the hospital and be admitted, could be picked up, yes? And I, I, I feel that uh, medical students during that work uh, learned a lot about management of COVID patients and, and, and some, some sort of virtual clinic for COVID-19 patients, supervision by faculty members, some sort of laddering between medical students and interns and residents and faculty members, two faculty members uh, support nearly 24 hours, seven days, nearly, I'm not sure, but nearly, because each time you visit the app, uh, WhatsApp, you could see interaction between students and faculty members. And I think that it was a good option for such sort of uh, uh, clinics and telemedicine that amateurs are talking about. Great, thank you so much for that response. Thank you very much, Dr. Mirzazada. Thank you very much, Catherine, for mentioning that point. Uh, I think other panelists uh, may uh, use this opportunity and experience to 
deploy that and apply that in their own regions if there is no uh, similar program for students. Uh, it may be some similar programs, but uh, if there is not a similar one, you know, we, we are running these webinars to share this kind of experience. Uh, I, I, before going to the next, yeah, before going to the next question, uh, Christina, you, you want to talk? Yeah, I just wanted to say that in Croatia, we do not have a similar pro program, but um, I would also like to highlight that uh, we didn't only have the COVID situation. Uh, we were also hit by three major earthquakes in just one morning. One little girl lost her life. Our hospitals were also damaged. Our faculty is ruined. So our doctors and our professors also deal with some other situations right now, not only the lecturers and students, and also all of us. We, we don't feel safe outside, but we also don't feel safe in our, or in our own homes at the moment. So that's the situation in Croatia. Thank you. I was about to ask you to share your experience regarding those earthquakes. And thank sorry, you for Ahmed, starting. A, sorry, sorry Ahmed, just during the pandemic, during the COVID-19 epidemic, we had an earthquake in Tehran. And just after that, there are a lot of jokes about uh, COVID-19 and earthquake. One of them, one of them was uh, COVID-19 asked us play stay at home, and earthquake asked us to stay uh, to stay out of home, and therefore we should stay at the door of our home. And, and, and just a few minutes after the earthquake, you could see a lot of joking about it. And I think that it, it could be considered a, a coping strategy to, to, to save the morale of the whole community to handle such a difficult situation. It, it was a difficult situation. Many people stayed that night out of their home. And they even they don't know what should they do. Thank you very much, Dr. Mirza. Yeah, that's true. You know, after the uh, earthquake, at the moment of the earthquake, we felt a very scary uh, situation. But uh, just immediately after that uh, moment, uh, we were just laughing off to several jokes that we were. Uh, receiving yeah christina yes please i also wanted to add one joke that was also popular in zagreb after the earthquake they made a photoshop uh, picture of zagreb and godzilla above it and it was saying that godzilla comes the third so we're waiting for it to come or something like that so yeah also, exactly we had the same exactly <laughs> we had the same uh, a photoshop a godzilla and the and and they, they the the joke was that this is the this is the next step our our fight with the uh with the uh, nature and this is the semi-final step yeah. <laughs> <laughs> thank you that that's interesting you know that even <laughs> crises and you know national crises are international and same everywhere uh, i think Godzilla is an you know international crisis too uh th thank you very much I, uh, I know that we do not have enough time, and I don't know if we should continue or not. I really like some of these questions. Uh, I don't know if we can continue or not. What do you think? I personally prefer to continue because I, you know, I really like these questions. Uh, Doctor Mirza, the professor Norsini. Uh, shall we continue or? On my side, I am ready. On my side, I am ready. But we should follow our senior. <laughs> it's hard for an old man to sit this long, but but I think we should continue. I, I, pardon <laughs> me, I, I, I didn't understand it. I couldn't hear it. I, we should continue. I said it's hard for an old man to sit this long, but we should probably continue. To be honest, he looks younger than all of us. Oh, uh, yeah. 
that's nice, but that's a lie. <laughs> Okay, so let's continue. Uh, there, there's there are two questions that I would like to uh, combine them. Uh, the first one is, uh, I'm sorry, do you think that the online medical education will have a slight lower quality because those vir virtual skills cannot match hands-on experience? And the other one which I would like to combine with is, I'm so sorry, uh, yeah. We have several answered questions here, and I'm, uh, oh, I found that. What are the solutions in different universities for student-teacher interactions through online and offline classes? Please share, share your experiences. Thank you very much. I know that these two questions are a little different, but I think we, we can merge them a little and uh, save some time. The floor is yours. Don't we have anyone from our panelists who would like to share their experience okay. regarding? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> go on. Um, so regarding the quality of teaching, I think, yes, there are things that you cannot teach during an online lecture, but I think the lectures, if they're used properly, if you have like this webinar, if you have your professor speaking to you and you can ask questions, and you can interact with each other. I think this is as good as teaching can be in this situation. But of course, there are things that can't be taught during this pandemic, like hands-on teaching, um, like clinical skills that you can only learn by actually assessing a patient and not by having facts on a PowerPoint slide. Um, but I think just for now, uh, while we cannot go into hospitals and in large groups of students, this is a good solution if you have the access to Zoom and uh, programs like that um, for the pandemic situation. But I'm, I think, yes, there are um, lacks in the quality of teaching that we need to make up as soon as it's possible to go back to hospitals and actually show the students in real people uh, what medicine looks like and what the clinic, actual clinic is. Thanks. Christina, I saw you opened your microphone. Oh, sorry, that was not on. Oh, <laughs> I thought that you want to answer. Uh, thank you, Julia, for your answer. Uh, Professor Norsini, Dr. Mirzazade, uh, what do you think regarding this question and the answers that uh, Julia had on this question, especially on the, uh, you know, hands-on experience and skills aspect that there is a, you know, a global concern all the students have this this concert. Professor Norsini. Uh, so I, I I agree with the student concerns. Uh, <laughs> I think there is there really is no substitution for being with patients and for learning from your time with them. I think simulation offers some possibilities. Uh, I think that, that a lot can be done online. Uh, I'm sure you've you've seen standardized patients uh, in a, used in OSCEs used in an online setting, and I think they're reasonably effective, with the obvious exception of uh, procedural skills and physical exam skills. Uh, but I, I think that this is a genuine issue, uh, and I, I think that it it really is the sort of thing that we'll need to wait until uh, students can interact with patients again. Uh I had the same answer, um, but uh, first of all, I think that uh, we should be pragmatic in considering the role of uh, online learning in current situation. I believe that first of all, um, online learning, online teaching is a rescue panel. When, when you are in a disaster situation, for example, fire, the fire workers try to save your life. You might suffer from, you may suffer from some burn. You lost your home, but you survive. And, and we, we should be 
uh, pragmatic and uh, realistic in our thinking about online learning. Please think if online learning doesn't exist in the current situation, what happens? We didn't do anything. We should wait at home after the medical school reopened. In this current situation, I think the online teaching is not only important because continue the stream of education, but more importantly, it shows the ability of human being to be innovative and to cope with the challenges he or she face. I believe that it's much more important that the knowledge transfer or the skills transfer during online teaching sufficient or insufficient, deficient, or any other uh, issues that we call it, the way name we call it. And, and, and I, I talked about this issue last night during a webinar by our students other other webinar that uh, I believe that we are role models for our students and for our colleagues. Please consider that we only wait and watch the current situation, wait to reopen medical school after COVID-19 the hopelessness and the loneliness of medical students. Yes, it's a bad situation. And they see the faculty members are stagnant, are waiters only. They learn from us that if you face a challenge, you should sit and you should shy and you should scream till the disaster ends. And I don't think that in such situation, we are good role models for our students and for our next generation. And therefore, first of all, we should think about a rescue panel. Rescue panel is, is not the perfect, just rescue. The second one, because we, you talk about the alternatives. Uh, just two months after uh, COVID-19 and closing the medical schools, we found that we lost the medical students, the clerks that should start the clerkship um, just early, uh, mid-April, early April, yes? And therefore, we decided to have a four-week virtual internal medicine clerkship for them. We started with online platform. Uh, we, we provided a transition course from pre-clerkship to post-clerkship to, to because there are a lot of differences in learning in uh, study skills and uh, to be familiar with the clinical reasoning, any other issues. And after that, we even have rounds, virtual rounds. We, after permission from our patients, we have only a smartphone, cell phone, that provide a video, a real uh, streaming, and broadcasting of the patient physician interaction bedside. And after that, the team moved to a room and the students could see the interaction between faculty members, students, uh, residents, and interns. Yes. We, we even finally, we provided some, uh, some such case-based discussion session as Christina talked about it. After that, we provided the patient information to a team of medical 
and they handled a session, case-based discussion about the patient, step by step, independently and just by support of faculty members. And we provide, we, uh, we enjoyed the help of eight uh, uh, clerks or interns that have role play as a patient. And, the, and in each eight team, the medical clerks virtually take a history from the virtual patient that was a medical clerk or intern yes and and I, we found and also we have some 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 uh, reflection sessions that in small groups students think about the experiences for example the first case presentation in our morning report and we talk about the reflection within and therefore i i believe that using powerfully of online learning social media platforms and interaction with medical students besides and uh, besides the LMS and offline platform could be helpful for gathering medical students and to help them find that I believe that education after COVID is a fiction. We we just and we should talk about education with COVID. And therefore, we reopen our clerkships just this week, just in non COVID wards. But what non COVID wards? Do you are you sure that any patient that admitted to any wards is non COVID? No. And therefore, we should provide PPE. We should be cautious about the principles of prevention of COVID-19. Thank you very much, Dr. Mirzazadeh. Uh, uh, you know, as Dr. Mirzazadeh said, our uh, wards are open again. And uh, I just got back, got back to the hospital about a week ago. And uh, I can confess that no, uh, there is no guarantee that the patient that comes to a neurology clinic uh, he or she doesn't have COVID-19 uh, as I had a, you know I had a patient in neurology uh, clinic uh, he stood up uh, exactly uh, 10 centimeters far from my nose and he was saying that doctors told me that I have COVID-19 but they're saying no, hmm, wrong things I do not have COVID-19 and uh, I, I was shocked like uh, why are you why are you standing in exactly in front of my face and that's the situation of our hospitals and uh, ev everywhere that's the situation of all hospitals and uh, that's the fact we cannot change that anytime uh, thank you very much dr princess uh, i think that we have covered uh, almost all questions and we are you know uh, 30 minutes uh, more uh, we have to, uh, I'm sorry, <laughs> we have passed 30 minutes uh, from our deadline, from the ending time. Just for recapping and uh, wrapping up the session, uh, Dr. Mirzazade, Professor Norsini, do you have the last word? Professor Norsini? And I don't really have the last word, do I? Um, I <laughs> uh, the last word is thank you. Uh, I really appreciate having had the opportunity to listen to the perspectives of all the students and the panelists and my good friend dr azim and i've learned quite a bit so i appreciate you having me be part of this have a good day thanks thank you very much dr norsen your humbleness and your kind support uh, you know means a lot to all of us and uh, we really appreciate you and dr mirza Zadeh for being in the session and sharing your great experience with us. Uh, before uh, saying goodbye and asking Katayun, our chair, uh, for, for her last word, I would like to 
appreciate and thank our uh, organizing team for this webinar. Dear Makina Haq, the coordinator of the webinar team, and dear Arsen Muhammuza, if I'm not wrong, National Working Group Chair of Rwanda, and Dr. Name Patel, National Working Group Member of Zambia, uh, who were uh, assigned to this session. And I really thank you. I really appreciate you uh, for organizing this meeting. Uh, Catherine, I will give the uh, floor to you for uh, for the last word. Uh, I say goodbye to everybody. Uh, Catherine, the floor is yours. Thank you so much, Ahmed Reza. I also wanted to thank everyone who attended today. Um, I wanted to thank our um, panelists. Uh, I'm going to call by first names because we're all friends and we've been on first name basis for a long time. Rina, Christina, Julia, and Nabil, it's been wonderful to see you and to hear from you. And uh, you'll, I hope you'll know how inspiring you all are. And that today's um, webinar was incredible. Hearing your insights was just uh, blowing me away. Um, I can't thank our moderators enough. Thank you, Professor Nursini, Dr. Mirza Zadeh. It was uh, amazing to have you here. We really learned a lot from both of you being here and um, you are truly our role models. I think I think that's the best way to put it. And we really appreciate you being here with us today. And um, Makina and Ahmad Reza and the team who put the webinars together week after week. Thank you so much. I think um, we are all very grateful to you and to the hard work that goes into these webinars. And we're excited every week to see what you have in store. Thank you and stay safe, everyone. And stay tuned for the next week webinar research. <laughs> It's about research. <laughs> Thank you, everyone. Have a great time. Thank you, guys. Thank you, everyone. Bye.